best are graded on 10 points each. The six others on five points each. Okay, so that helps people who know how to do uh, some of the problems. Like if you are able to do seven problems, you already have 70% of a grade. Okay, if I were to grade this uniformly, you would get only seven on 13. That's a little over 50%. So I do that because I believe that grading uniformly is, uh, is not that fair. Uh, I, and I like to uh, give more points to people who have understood at least part of the material. Uh, people who are in this category here uh, should be worried. And more than that, uh, my advice, if you are here and you have not taken 341, drop the course. Wait until next semester, take 341, and you'll take 431 next semester. Okay? Uh, many of the people here really are, lack the background to make it in this class. And you run a, a risk, uh, uh, a high risk of ending up with a D or an F in this class. So think about it. If you took 341 and you're still in this category, there are one or two like that. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, you had a bad day, and uh, we can uh, things things will improve because it's uh, it's not as uh, uh, as bad as uh, some other people. So come talk to me anyway. You know if you you have questions, and uh, we'll uh, we we can talk things over. But the reason there is 341 is precisely because many people need to have a year long analysis. Uh, one semester is is just too short. Things are going to not get really more difficult, but you have a lot more stuff. And if already with, uh, you know, the fundamental property, the well-ordering principle, and the Archimedean uh, property, you are having trouble sorting out what to use when, uh, it's going to get much worse when we get all these theorems you need to use. So there, there is a, a fair amount of uh, things that we need to do, and uh, that's why this test I consider was rather easy. And uh, if you are below 58%, you definitely should think of dropping this course. Okay, so I'm not going to go over this uh, uh, test because we, we have done most of it in reviews and so on. I have written the solution, so have a look at it, and uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, any question or comment? So let's uh, go on with chapter five. And let's, so le let's recall what we did. So first thing, let's talk about continuity. So assume that F is defined on some domain D, which is included in the rails. Uh, let A belong to D. F is said to be continuous at A if for all sequences a n in D such that a n converges to a f of a n converges to f of a Okay, that's our definition of, uh, at least the first definition of continuity. So, uh, 
the type of thing you can uh, you can do is uh, construct continuous functions starting with some elementary ones. So uh, that's what we are going to do first. Uh, assume that, so first thing, first example, a constant function is continuous. At A, uh, for any A, in variables. Okay, why? How do you see that? Well, the domain in this case would be R, of course. Constant function is defined everywhere. And uh, you take a sequence AN converging to A. Then F of AN is C, because that's the constant function, and f of A is C. So this implies that f of A n converges to f of A. It's just a, a triviality, because you have a constant sequence here, and of course it's going to converge to the constant, and the constant is the value you want it to converge to. So you just apply your definition and, and you get that the constant functions are all continuous. Another example, if you take f of x equal x, again your domain is the reals. You take any a you want in R, then you, you have a sequence a n converging to a. Okay, so you give yourself a point. And you give yourself a sequence that converges to A. But uh, it, I mean, you, you take any sequence converging to A. Okay? You cannot pick a particular sequence. Then you look at F of A n. <coughs> what is F of A n? It's A n, right? It's A n and a n converges to a, and a is f of a. So you get that f of a n converges to f of a. So again, you get that this is a continuous function. Yes? So you were saying before, it wouldn't be proper to define what r c of a is? No, because the property must be true for any sequence. Okay. You see, the problem is that you may have some sequence, if your function is not continuous, you may have a property working from some, for some sequence, but not all. And then it's not a continuous function. Okay. So that's the problem. That's why okay. you yeah, a generic AN converging to A. Okay. The only thing you know about AN is that it converges to A. That's all. You don't know anything else. Okay, so we have a constant, we have the identity, and now we can build over polynomials, for instance, and over rational functions uh, using products, additions, So we are going to do operations on continuous functions. And it's going to look a lot like. So what do I want? Uh, I'm assuming that f and g are defined on the same d. And assuming, I'm assuming also that f and g are continuous. Uh, at a, belonging to d. 
then we have that f plus g is continuous at a. We have that f times g is continuous at a. And we have that uh, f or g is continuous at a if g of a is different from zero. And in order to prove that, of course, we are going to use operations on limits that we have seen recently. And uh, uh, for instance, <coughs> for i, so take any sequence a n converging to a, then we know that f of a n converges to f of a, and we know that uh, g of a n converges to g of a. So f of a n plus uh, g of a n converges to f of a plus g of a. What am I using when I'm saying that this is a true statement? Operations on limits. Okay, the addition of two convergent sequences is convergent, and the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. Okay, that's what we are using exactly. So operations on limits allows me to do that. And now, for a question of uh, uh, sake of precision, you you can rewrite this as being f plus g of a n, and it converges to f plus g of a. Because that's our definition of the sum of two functions. Okay? The f of a n plus g of a n is f plus g of a n. That's how we define f plus g. The function f plus g is defined like this. So what I'm really saying is that f plus g of a n converges to f plus g of a. Therefore, f plus g is continuous at a. And that proves i. Now, to prove 2i, you do exactly the same thing, except that this time you're going to say f of a n times g of a n converges to f of a times g of a. That's a gain operation on limits, this time multiplying two convergent sequences. And I know that the product converges to the product of the limits. Okay. It's another operation on limits. And same thing, we can say, well, but this is actually fg of a n. That's how we define the function product fg by saying it's the product of the two images. <coughs> so this converges to fg of a. And we conclude, well, then fg is continuous at a. Okay. For the ratio, we, there is a little difficulty, which is that we are assuming that g of a is different from 0. But maybe g of a n is equal to 0. And then it doesn't even make sense to look at f of a n over g of a n. However, because we know that g of a n converges to g of a, and that g of a is different from 0, what we're going to say is, draw a picture, say 
g of phi is not zero, so it's, let's assume it's negative because you usually don't like negative numbers. So let's, let's reason with a negative number here and let's say the following, well, I know this sequence converges to this guy, I'm going to take an epsilon small enough so that everybody is on the negative side and I know my g of phi n will be in here and therefore g of a n is not zero. It's strictly negative. Therefore, I can use my ratio limits and I'll be done. Okay, so that's what my plan is. Of course, if g of a is positive, I do exactly the symmetric thing. I put myself here, I draw my little interval here, and so on. So, what should I take for my uh, epsilon? Or what is this point? What's, what's the natural field? G of a over 2 is a, is a good idea. Okay, so g of a over, over 2 is what? It's a g of a plus epsilon, which means that my epsilon is minus g of a over 2. Is that an allowed uh, epsilon? No. Oh, yes, because we know that our g of a is less than 0. Right, so we want something positive. The opposite of g of a will do. Yeah? Okay. So we get our epsilon. And now we say, well, so re remember what we, we are doing here. We are assuming first that a n goes to a, and we know that g is continuous at a, therefore g of a n must go to g of a. That's our hypothesis. Okay, that's why I'm using that. And uh, we want to conclude that the ratio f of a n over g of a n converges to f of a over g of a. And in order to do that, we apply this, the, 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 the ratio must be well defined. So that's why we're doing this. So people that are less brave than us uh, prove this theorem by saying, well, I'm take a g of x which is never zero. So you don't have to bother with doing that. But that's, um, so let's uh, uh, finish this thing. For every epsilon, so we take epsilon equal minus g of a over two. There exists an n, so that if n is bigger than capital N, then g of a n minus g of a is less than minus g of a over 2. And that's what I want. I want to, actually, I want, I need only one inequality, which is this one. So we get g of a n less than g of a over 2. And that's strictly negative. Uh, so in particular, I know that g of a n is not 0 for all n bigger than capital N. That's all we have to do to use that operational limits. Correct. Okay, so now what we have is that f of a n over g of a n is defined, is well defined for n larger than capital N. Okay, it may very well be that I cannot define the ratio for the, the first n. Doesn't matter, I'm looking at limits, so I don't care. Then operation on limits tells me that f of a n over g of a n converges to f of a over g of a. I can do that every time. My sequence is not zero at the denominator, and the limit is not zero, of course. Okay. So this again is the definition of f of g of of a n converges to f of g of a. And that tells me that f over g 
is continuous attack. So the consequences of that the n power of x is going to be continuous everywhere. Why? You may have a discontinuous increasing function. <coughs> no, use operations on continuous functions. Well, how would you prove that x squared is a continuous function by using what we just did? x times x. x is continuous. x is continuous. You, you do the product, you get to continuous. So for x to the n, you do it n times. Okay? So you buy. So a product of continuous functions is continuous. Now if I define g of x as being cxn, this is also continuous everywhere. Why is that? Again, I know that the constant is continuous, and x to the n is continuous, so the product is continuous. Okay. Again, this is a product of continuous functions. So that's not a problem. We can generalize this to any polynomial, c0 plus c1x plus cnxn. And this time, we use the addition of continuous functions. Okay, c0 is a constant, it's continuous. c1x is a product of two continuous functions, therefore it's continuous. And so I keep adding continuous functions. Okay, so this is continuous everywhere. Uh, and that's the, and the reason is that we are doing addition of continuous functions. <laughs> So any polynomial. But remember, polynomials are with natural powers. Okay, at this point, we we still don't know whether, for instance, uh, h of x equal to square root of x is continuous. Okay, that doesn't apply. Okay, because this is not this is power half, or we don't know that 1 over x is continuous. Of course, uh, not everywhere in any case, because this is defined only for positive x's, and this is defined for x different from 0. So that, that doesn't apply to this yet. Okay? Of course, these will be continuous functions, I reassure you. But we'll need to, have to come up with a different proof. Uh, what else? Rational functions, when you do the ratio of two polynomials, you get what we call a rational function. So you call r of x equal to p of x over q of x. So where p and q are polynomials. Now, where is R going to be continuous, in your opinion? 
where Q is not zero, exactly. So R is continuous where defined, let's say. Okay, because if Q is zero at, at A, then R is not defined at A. <coughs> So, which, by the way, gives me this. Okay, this is a rational function. Okay, but doesn't give me the other one. So let's. So example, one over x is continuous at a different from zero. And that's because since uh, 1 over x is the ratio of two continuous functions. Another example, the function a of x equal to absolute value of x is continuous everywhere So let's take A anywhere in, in R. Let's take A and converge into A. And let's um, okay, so let's use that AN minus A is less than AN minus A. Okay, we proved this for home, for homework purposes, and we used it a couple of times already. Okay, you you get this by uh, doing the triangle inequality twice, and um, you, you you get the two bounds. Anyway, this is a true statement. So, what you uh, have here is so. What do you have here? Uh, you have here that since a n converges to a, hmm. right? Since a n converges to a, a n minus a converges to zero because I can add constants, and I'll get this, and you get that absolute value of a n minus a converges to zero. Do you remember why this? What what result am I using when I'm saying that? But the property that says that the sequence converges to zero if and only if its absolute value converges to zero. Okay, that was a lemma that we we proved at some point. So we know that this is a true statement. Okay. So if we know that, then we can. Uh, uh, say that this goes to zero and this goes to zero. Therefore, by the squeezing principle, uh, we know that the middle thing must go to zero as well. But again, when uh, something goes to zero, it goes to zero with or without absolute value. Right? So I can get rid of my absolute value. And now I can say, well, then AN must converge to A. Right? 
which operation I'm using here when I go from here to here? <coughs> Addition of convergent sequences, right? Because I do an minus a plus a must converge to an. So we get that an converges to a, <coughs> which uh, uh, with my notation is a of an converges to a of a. And that, that proves uh, that absolute value is a continuous function. What else can we do in terms of operations? We can compose continuous functions to get a new con continu continuous function. So let's do that now. Um, right. So what we want is to property. We have that f is defined on d. G is defined on the range of F. So the range of F is the, the value, so F of X, when X belongs to D. And assume that uh, We'll assume that f is continuous at a. And that g is continuous at f of a. Then the composition uh, g composed with f is continuous at a. So let's take a n in D such that a n converges to a. Then we have that f of a n converges to f of a. <coughs> Continuity of f at a. And then we have a g of f of a n converges to G of F of A. Why? Why can I say that G of F of A N converges to G of F of A? G is continuous at F of A, meaning that any sequence that goes to F of A must have a property G of a sequence converging to G of F of A. Okay, it's the definition of continuity at f of a. So we get this, and therefore the composition <coughs> is this. And uh, we get that this is continuous at uh, a. And we are done. Example of uh, something like this, we could write that h of x is absolute value of x cubed. So we just write this as being the absolute value of the power function x 
okay, where p of x is x cubed and absolute value of x is absolute value. A of x is absolute value of x. Okay, so by composition, you know that H is the composition of A and P and is continuous anywhere since A and P are. What's the have one like that on the test. You'd like one like that in the yeah, test? Yeah, that's my kind of proof, you know? One or two lines. Yeah. Well, some of them were like that in this test. So these are uh, a lot of, we can get a lot of new functions by doing these compositions and by doing the, the other operations we have seen. Okay, let's uh, go on to uh, to the intermediate value theorem. So assume that F is continuous on A, B. So this is a closed, okay, I'm, I'm uh, including my endpoints interval, meaning that there is no hole in this set. I'm taking the whole thing between A and B. And assume that, so how do we free this thing? Yeah, assume that also let C be between F of A and F of B. Then there is uh, C, okay. There is D in A, B. Let me keep the same notation as here. There is D in A, B such that F of D is C. So, uh, well, maybe I should take A here. A here, B here. So let's, we have a, a continuous function like this, and we have A here and B here, and then we pick a C some, yeah? Oh, okay, yeah. What I wrote is correct, but let's write the same thing. So, if we do strictly between here, okay, so C is strictly between F of A and F of B, then D is strictly between A and B. So, you, you would uh, get rid of the endpoints. If, if you don't put strict, then you should include your endpoints as well. Is that what I say? Yeah.
so uh, what we're doing is picking a C anywhere on the range between f of A and f of B and uh, saying, well, there is a D so that you, you get f of D is C. Okay, there is a solution to the equation f of x equals c. Actually, there are at least two here. Well, this one is outside the range, but uh, is, is not between a and b. But anyway, so that's the idea. It's simply that you can go back because you have a continuous function. You know you're not jumping. And if you take the value f of a and the value f of b, you must take all the values between them. That's why it's called the intermediate value theorem. Okay. It looks like you, you preferred the explanation without the drawing. It's kind of messy. Um, should I draw this bigger? Okay. So let's see. So let's. Uh, I hope you didn't expect the same drawing. <laughs> okay, here is my function. Here are A and B. And let's take a C, like here. Okay, this is C. And then let's look for a D that gives me f of D equals C, so, and which is between A and B. So this is a good candidate. Okay, how, this is how you would find your D. Now, uh, the converse of this result is not true. Meaning that there are functions that have the intermediate value property, but that are not continuous. Okay, it's not very difficult to say this. You just draw something like this. And you see that you don't have holes in your range. You cover everything. However, this is not a continuous function. So the, the converse is not true. Okay, proof of that. Well, the, the proof is quite natural. Uh, what you do is that you, you keep dividing your interval in two until, well, and, and to produce convergent sequences that are going to, to converge to the solution of your equation. Uh, the first uh, thing you do in, uh, in this proof is actually solve a particular case. So assume that f of a is negative and f of b is positive. And so uh, let's take c equals 0. Okay, we'd like to know whether we can find a d so that f of d is equal to c. Okay, so what we are trying to do really is to solve the equation f of x equals 0. So in the particular case, in this particular case, what you do is you construct a sequence uh, in the following way. So you get a1 equal to a and b1 equal to b. And then so A is here, B is here. Then you go to the midpoint, A plus B over 2. And you look at your at F of A plus B over 2. And you have three possibilities. It may be 0. In which case you jump with joy because you have found your D. 
okay? That never happens. I, uh, I prefer to, to warn you. But anyway, that's the end of it, because that's wh exactly what you're looking for. Second possibility, you have a plus b over 2 is negative. Then it means that uh, your a2, if this is the case, then set a2 equal to a plus b over 2 and b2 equal to b. You keep the same b. The reason being that here you are negative, here you are positive. And so you know your solution is somewhere between a2 and b2. So that's one uh, possi the second possibility. Third possibility, of course, is f of a plus b over 2, strictly positive. And then you would keep a2 equal a, and b2 equal to a plus b over 2. And you know you need to search between a2 and b2 to find your d. Okay, does this make sense? And you go on like this. So the, the point is that if you look at what we did here, when you do b2 minus a2, you actually uh, get an interval which is half of what you had okay, in all cases. Because you took the midpoint. So you, you divided your uh, first interval by 2. The other thing you do when you are, uh, what you should notice is that your A2 is necessarily bigger than or equal to A1. Because it's either A1 or it is the midpoint, so it's going to be bigger. And similarly, B2 is less than or equal to B1. Okay? Now, uh, I'll let you do the generic N, uh, but it basically works like going from 1 to 2. Then you do a proof by induction where you do a following. So you, you need to do a generic proof. So induction. For all n, uh, we have. So what do we have? A n minus one less than A n, which is less than B n, which is less than B n minus one, and B n minus A n less than b1 minus a1 over 2 to the n. OK, so you assume you, you were successful up to the n step, and then you go to the following step. How do you go to the following step? You do exactly this. Okay, You do f of a n plus bn over 2, you compute the midpoint, and you decide what is your an plus 1 and bn plus 1 going to be. And you, you get this thing. So uh, what this is, is that you are building uh, an increasing sequence an, you are building a decreasing sequence bn, and you are having that uh, an is less than bn. This should be should bring back to you bad memories, <laughs> botch homework. Okay, do you remember this problem? So, in particular, what was the very popular mistake you did here to show that a n and b n was convergent, or rather, give me a good argument to to show that a n and b n are convergent. So they By what? B1. By B1 and A1, yes, not BN and A N. Okay, so that's what you argue. Yes, you argue that because you have a decreasing sequence here, this is necessarily less than B1, and therefore your A N is bounded by B1, and your A N is increasing. So you get that your A N converges to some D. Well, we should call it uh, L or A, 
No, not L. Uh, L. And you do the same thing for BN. You say, well, BN is decreasing, bounded below by A1. So uh, BN converges to L2. However, B, what happens to BN minus AN using this inequality? Well, what happens to B1 minus, AN minus A1 over 2 to the N when N goes to infinity? What, what happens to this term? It goes to 0. 2 to the N goes to infinity. And therefore, you're dividing by something uh, going to infinity. You get 0. And this is positive because remember uh, we, the way we set up things, our BN is always bigger than our AN. That's the, the right hand point. Therefore, squeezing it, you get that BN minus AN goes to 0. Okay, so we also know that BN minus AN goes to 0, which means that L1 is equal to L2. Okay, therefore, this also goes to L1 minus L2. And <coughs> you get that L1 must be equal to L2. And that's what we call D. That's our D. So it's a constructive proof. We, we give a method to find the sequence. We don't find the limit because we don't have a method to find the limit. But uh, you, we can find approximations using this. Okay? You compute A, A100 and B100, and uh, you have a nice approximation of what your D is. So that was the particular case. Uh, no, no, the general case is easy, but uh, we're not quite done. Uh, so, general case now. What if C is not zero? Okay? That's what we want to know. We have solved the case C equals zero. What do we do when we don't have zero? Well, we define G, and that's something you should remember, uh, as being f of x minus c. Because then g of c, uh, well, then what, what our problem is, uh, f, okay, f of d is c if and only if g of d is 0. So the problem of finding in general is really can, can be translated to finding it for zero for the function g. And the function g is a nice continuous function as well, defined in the same interval, since you are only uh, moving by a constant. Okay? Difference of two continuous functions, it's continuous. Okay? So we should note this, that g is continuous on a, b. Uh, as a difference as a difference of two continuous functions. So you can apply the intermediate value theorem, find the d for g, but the, the d for g is the same as uh, the d for f, and you're done. Now, do we really need continuity to apply this theorem? Well, not always, but certainly it's not true in general, because just do this, you have a function that does this, and uh, you take, so your, um, your a this time is here, and your b is here, so this is f of b. Then you pick a c here. And you can look for D, you are not going to find one. 
of course. Okay, so the theorem is not true if you don't assume continuity. What if you assume that it's defined? This is defined everywhere. No, de defined everywhere from A to B. It, that f, uh, f of x is defined on the interval A to B. Yeah, you see, my drawing is not very good, but what you what you can do is uh, you you take you include this point here, you exclude this one, and oh, you make okay, it jump. Lined see, it's lined up. Yes, yeah, so it is defined everywhere, but it's not continuous everywhere, and that's where the trouble is. Okay. That's another, that's a nice characterization of continuity is that a function is continuous if and only if, uh, well, okay, a function is continuous on an interval if and only if its range is an interval. Okay, so here my range is an interval, there are no holes between A and B. In, in the range, I'm sorry, in the domain there are no holes. However, when I do uh, the range of this function, I don't get an interval because I have a big hole here. And therefore that's not a continuous function. So that's a test uh, we have about continuity on intervals. Okay, homework for a week from Thursday. The 11? 12. Okay. So, section 5.1, 2, 3, seven, eight. Oh, okay. Nine, eleven, fifteen, sixteen. October twelfth. 